Expand your vocabulary with our core 2,000 words ebook. It's free and packed with essential expressions that you'll use on a daily basis. Start building your vocabulary today. Click the link in the description below to download your free English ebook before it's gone. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe. Let's get to your first question this week. First question this week comes from Zachary. Hi, Zachary. Zachary says, Hi, Alicia. What's the difference between no more and not anymore? Also, what's the difference between no more and no longer? Thank you. Great question. Okay, let's talk about no more and not anymore to start, and then we'll go to the second part. So, no more can be used in a couple of different situations. First, let's talk about the everyday conversational use of no more. We use no more to express like when something is too much. For example, if someone is bringing us lots and lots of food to eat, we might say, oh, no more, meaning no more food, please, or no more of that, please. It's too much. So, we use no more to mean I don't want any more of that. So you might have just picked up on me also using any more in this situation too. So when I said no more, please, it means like too much. I don't want that anymore. But we cannot use not anymore in this situation. We use not anymore to refer to a condition that has changed. So for example, if you worked at company A for a very long time and then changed your company, you might use not anymore to express this in a conversation with another person. They might say to you, hey, are you still working at company A? And you might say, not anymore. Now I'm working at company B. So this expresses a change in condition. So I am not anymore working at that company. So not anymore is used to express a change in condition. When I used no more to express that something was too much and I wanted something to stop, I said, ah, no more, please, no more. I don't want any more of that. So we use this slightly different form to express something is too much and we use not anymore to talk about a change in condition. Here's another example where you might use not anymore. For example, in a conversation between two friends talking about their dating life, one person might say, hey, I thought that you were seeing that guy that you met at the bar last week. And the second person might say, mm, not anymore, we weren't a good fit. So again, this expresses a change in condition. We use not anymore to talk about something that is different from the expected condition. So I hope this helps show the difference between no more and not anymore. Now let's talk about no longer, no longer. We don't use no longer so much in everyday conversation, but it can be used also, like not anymore, to talk about a change in condition or a desired change in condition. For example, you might hear a politician use the expression no longer to talk about a desired change for the future, like no longer will we have to struggle in this situation. So that means not anymore will we have to struggle in this situation. So this use of no longer is often used in kind of like motivating speeches, like in a politics situation or maybe Maybe in like a war or battle situation in movies, like no longer will we do this thing or no longer will we stand for this policy, something like that. It means we are not going to do that anymore. So the grammar I'm using there is no longer will we. This means we are not going to do that anymore. So you can kind of think of no longer as like a more formal way of saying not anymore, but we tend to use it to talk about our future plans or our future expectations. Like I'm no longer going to be working for this company or or I'm no longer going to do X, Y, and Z. So this is talking about something that will not be true in the future or that we desire to not be true in the future. So I hope this kind of clarifies the difference between these words. Finally, the last point I want to make is about the first expression, no more. So we also use this no more in the same way as no longer to mean this is something we are not going to put up with anymore. So we use this no more again in more formal situations like when we're talking about struggle, so like some kind of political difficulty, for example, like country A is giving country B a hard time and we will stand for this no more. So again, these kinds of expressions, no more and no longer, tend to sound a little bit more formal, but you may see them in like dramatic movies or in political situations. We don't really use them so much in everyday conversation, even in professional conversation, but this is maybe how you might see them used from time to time. So I hope that this this helps you understand the differences between these three expressions.
questions. Interesting question. Okay, great. Thanks very much for sending along that question. Let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Maryam Atef. Hi, Maryam. Maryam says, what is the difference between immigration, migration, and emigration? Great question. Okay, immigration, migration, emigration. Let's talk about migration first. Migration refers to animals, the patterns of animals in the different seasons. So we often use migration to talk about birds. So migration refers to the seasonal movement patterns of animals. So birds often migrate, that's the verb form, they migrate south for the winter. They go to warmer climates. So the noun form of this is migration. We sometimes use migration to talk about people's movements as well, like especially when we're talking about climate change, people moving from certain regions of the world to other regions of the world as maybe climate change has affected their home region. So migration is usually used to talk about the behaviors of animals in relationship to the seasons, but you may occasionally see it used to talk about how people's movements have changed in response to like climate related issues. Now though, let's talk about immigration and emigration. So they are very, very closely related. To emigrate, with an E, refers to leaving your own country. So leaving the place that you are from or the place where you were born. That is emigration. Immigration means going into the new country. So you can see how these are very, very commonly confused and very, very easy to mix up. If you get confused between them, that's okay. That's totally normal. It's very normal to check the dictionary just to make sure before you use one of these words. So immigration, maybe it can be helpful for you to think of immigration as sounding kind of like in, right? So I know it's I-M-M, -M, immigration, but it sounds a little bit like in. So remember immigration as going into the country. Emigration refers to leaving the country, departing the country. So as you can see, they're very, very closely related. So you would say in a sentence, I immigrated to country A, or I emigrated from country B. That's the difference here. Immigration is the noun form. Emigration is the noun form as well. To immigrate and to emigrate are the verb forms. So I hope that helps answer your question. Thanks very much for sending it along. Okay, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Jose. Hi, Jose. Jose says, hi, could you please explain to us the usages of used to, be used to, and get used to? I would really appreciate it. Okay, thanks very much for this question. So the answer to this question does depend on the structure of the sentence. We have used to and this be used to. So we have these two things that really, really depend on the structure of the surrounding sentence. When we use the expression used to, like I'm used to doing this or I'm used to doing that, it means I am accustomed to doing that thing. So I'm used to cooking dinner every day or I'm used to exercising every morning. It means I'm accustomed to doing that thing thing. Be used to, on the other hand, refers to the function of something. So for example, my phone is used to make calls refers to the function of my phone. Or this computer is used to edit videos that refers to the function of that computer. So when we use the be verb used to pattern, we're referring to the function of something. Okay, so we have this used to and is used to pattern to consider. So let's talk about the last one, get used to. We use this in expressions like, ah, you'll get used to it, or don't worry, give it a couple weeks, you'll get used to your new job. This means you will become accustomed to doing something, or you will become accustomed to a new situation. Get used to something is used to express that future expectation that you will become accustomed to something. You might also hear this used in past tense, like, ah, after a month, I got used to it, which means it took about a month and then I was accustomed to doing that thing. So to get used to something is used to talk about becoming accustomed to a new situation or maybe to a new action that you have to do. Okay, great. So I hope this quick answer gives you a good introduction to the differences between these expressions. To recap, used to refers to being accustomed to something. Be used to refers to the function of something. And get used to refers to becoming accustomed to something. Or in past tense, refers to having become accustomed to something. So I hope this answers your question. Thanks very much for sending it along. Okay, that is everything that I have for this week. So thank you as always for sending your great questions. 
Hi everybody, welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe. Let's get to your first question this week. First question this week comes from Ninad. Hi Ninad, I hope I said your name correctly. Ninad says, what does clocks mean here? Before anyone clocks my chopper. Oh, super great question. So clocks, this has a couple of different meanings. We'll talk about this first one that we saw in your example sentence, and then we'll talk about a second use of clocks as a verb here. So clock as a noun, of course, is the thing that we use to tell time. But as a verb, it has a totally, totally different meaning. So don't think about time at all with this answer. So first, let's look at the example sentence that you provided. Before anyone clocks my chopper. So chopper is another way to say helicopter. But Clocks here means impacts or runs into or hits or damages in some way. So we can sometimes use this word in like fight situations. For example, if we want to talk about a fist fight between two people, we might say one guy clocked the other guy, which means punched the other guy. Usually it refers to a punch, some kind of impact in some way. So we use clocks in this way to mean he punched the other person. You might also hear people using clock in this kind of situation that you've described here. Clocks my chopper, which means impacts or hits my chopper or hits my vehicle in some way. He clocked me. You might hear this used in like a car accident situation to talk about the impact of two vehicles. So the reason that we use clock instead of like impact is because clock sounds a lot more casual and kind of rough. And it sounds kind of more like a word we would use in like a fight situation. So there's a little bit of kind of an aggressive feel of this too. So if you wanted to talk about a car accident in kind of a casual rough way, like maybe if you're describing an experience to a friend or to a family member and not to, for example, the police, you would maybe choose to use the word clock. Like, ah, oh, the other car clocked me out of nowhere. That sounds like you were impacted in a very surprising way and then it was kind of aggressive or it was a very like shocking moment. So clock can be used in this way to talk about hits and impacts and damages in fights and in other accident kind of situations. So this is one use of clock as a verb. I want to talk about one more use of clock as a verb, and that is when we're talking about like racing scenarios in lots of cases. So you might hear clock used in a situation like this. We clocked him at 60 miles an hour. So this use of clock means tracked someone's speed or tracked someone's time. So when you clock a vehicle, usually there's some kind of number that comes along with this meaning. So in my example sentence, we clocked him at 60 miles an hour. That means the pace of the car was traveling at 60 miles an hour or the pace of the vehicle was traveling at 60 miles an hour. So when you hear clock used with a number, usually this is what happens with this pattern, it means that's the pace or that's the time that we tracked someone moving at. So here's another example. So for this example, let's talk about a runner, someone running in a marathon or someone running in a running event. If you want to describe that person's time, you might use the verb clock to do it. For example, Usain Bolt was clocked at one minute 30 seconds for the race. So that means that was the time that was recorded. If it helps you, you can think of this use of clock as having some relationship to an actual clock in that you use the clock to understand how much time has passed or the speed of someone's travels or whatever that might be. But this use of clock is usually used to talk about pace, to talk about the speed of something, uh, and we typically use it with a number. So that's a quick way that you can figure out, is this a hit and impact clock or is this a pace clock? Usually the pace and the time one will have some kind of number along with it. Usually when you talk about an impact, there's not a number. Maybe you might hear somebody say, oh, he clocked my car at 60 miles an hour. And in that case, it might be kind of ambiguous and you might need to ask a follow-up question. In that case, even a native speaker would ask a follow-up question. They might say, wait, do you mean he was traveling at 60 miles an hour or his car hit you and he was going at 60 miles an hour? Like you might need to clarify a little bit and that's totally natural. But I hope that this answer helps you understand the different uses of clock as a verb. To recap, we have 
impact, to clock, meaning something impacts something else. And we also have clock, meaning to record the time or to record the speed of someone else's movement or someone else's travel. So thanks very much for this interesting question. I hope this answered it. Okay, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Vaughn. Hi, Vaughn. Vaughn says, I recently learned the expression to shed light on something. I understand this means to reveal something, but what does shed mean in this expression? I checked the dictionary and it seems this word has many uses. Can you talk about it? Yes, definitely. Okay, so yes, the word shed has a lot of different uses. We have the noun form. The noun form often refers to a small building, a very small building, like you can imagine it the slightly bigger than a closet that we usually keep outside of our houses. This is the place where we might store like gardening, tools or other kind of home use equipment, stuff that gets dirty easily. We might keep this in a shed. So that's a very, very common noun use of this word. But this expression, to shed light on something, uses shed as a verb. And there are several different uses of shed as a verb. So let's break down a few of the most common ones. First, when we use to shed light on something, as you said in your question, it does mean like to reveal or like to give some kind of clarity to a situation. So one key thing that you can think about with the verb form of shed is that a lot of the meanings of shed as a verb are related to like giving something or taking off something or removing something. So in this case, you can think of to shed light on something as putting light on something. When you put light on a surface, you can see it more clearly, right? So that's kind of one way to think about it. The other uses of shed are closely related to this idea of removing something or revealing something. So let's talk about a couple more. First, to shed is commonly used with animals. So animals, when they lose hair or for like maybe snakes and other reptiles, when they lose their skin, we use the verb shed to talk about that. We would say, for example, oh, my cat is shedding, which means my cat is losing their hair. Maybe it's getting hot, so the cat is losing their hair. We call this shedding. So they are removing their skin or they are removing their hair. With a snake, for example, you might say, oh, the snake is shedding its skin. So that means it's removing one layer of skin. So to shed with animals means removing like some kind of hair or some kind of skin something like that. We have a similar application of shed when we talk about humans and kind of like their bacteria and their germs as well. So one application that we see of shed in the news these days is when we hear people talk about shedding virus or shedding some kind of bacteria, shedding something, that means we are giving off some kind of germ or we're giving off some kind of virus or bacteria. So again, it's that same idea of kind of releasing something from your body. So something is coming off of you. In this case, it's germs. So we have this application for humans and we have it for animals. But in both cases, we're talking about giving something off. We also have the meaning of just letting go of something, of throwing something away kind of with shed too. So for example, when we say like, oh, I need to shed these things from my life, I need to shed these concepts from my mind, it sounds like you're letting go of something. You're giving that thing to the universe maybe, or you're, you're going to stop thinking about that thing. So we also have this. This use of shed tends to sound a little bit more formal. We might not use this so much in everyday speech, but you might see someone use this in a media situation, like in a movie perhaps, or in a TV show maybe. We don't really use this so much when we talk to our close friends and our close family members, but you may see this use of shed. So the final use of shed that I want to talk about in this video is one that you kind of see sometimes in emotional situations. When we talk about someone crying, we often use the expression to shed tears. So again, we have that same idea of removing something or kind of letting something out, giving something. So in this case, the tears come from our eyes. You can think of the eyes kind of giving us our tears if you want to imagine it that way. But we have this expression to shed tears, which means to cry. So that means referring specifically to the water coming from your eyes. This is another common use of shed. So to recap quickly, as I said before, all of these uses of shed have the common kind of meaning of 
giving something off or removing something or something kind of being revealed in some way. So I hope that this answers your question about the use of shed in the expression to shed light on. And I hope this answer also helps prepare you for the other uses of shed that you might see here and there. So thanks very much for this interesting question. Let's move on to the next question. Okay, next question comes from Mari. Hi, Mari. Mari says, I know there are some curse words in English people use when they're very angry or upset, and they are rude words. But sometimes I hear people use words like shoot, too. Are these words rude? Are these curse words? How do I use them? Super good question, yeah. So yes, there are many very creative sometimes curse words or swear words or bad words in English. We have a few different vocabulary words we use to talk about them. Curse words or swear words or bad words. These are the words that yes, they are rude and we should not use them in polite situations. Don't use swear words at work or when you're meeting like your relatives, maybe, I don't know, maybe you have a special relationship with your family. Family and it's okay in your family culture to use swear words. That's cool. That's up to you. But generally, yes, swear words are not acceptable in polite situations. However, we do have these kind of substitute swear words. So if you're in a situation where maybe you injure yourself or you make a mistake and you want to kind of express your frustration, but you need to do it in a polite way, we do have these kind of soft curse words. So shoot is one perfect example of this. So regarding whether you can use them or how to use them and so on, these are words that you can use pretty much anywhere. Little kids are taught to use these words to express their frustrations in a polite and soft way too. So it's okay for adults to use them as well. So shoot is one example of this. Another good one is darn, D-A-R-N. So when you make a mistake, people might say, Darn. So this is a very, very, very soft way to express frustration or to express that you're feeling upset. So I would say shoot and darn are probably some of the most common ones in American English, and those are probably some of the most popularly taught to kids. Some other examples of sort of soft swear words might be dang it. Dang it. So dang it is D-A-N-G-I-T, dang it. So again, we use this when we've made a mistake or something has gone wrong. And you might often hear people using this kind of snap sound along with that too. Dang it, I messed that up. Or dang it, I didn't do that correctly. Whatever that might be. So that's another common one. So you could put darn and dang it together to get darn it as well. So you might have heard that in like a cowboy movie somewhere along the line too. That's another one that you might hear in media from time to time. So each person kind of chooses whichever sorts of soft curse words they feel are the most appropriate, or sometimes we just make up something in the moment that sounds kind of funny. So some other common ones that you might hear are people using the word fudge to mean that they've made a mistake. They can use this as a verb, like, ah, oh, I fudged this. Or you might use it as an exclamation, like, ah, oh, fudge, I messed it up. Fudge is a type of chocolate. So <laughs> this is a pretty soft kind of curse word. So you might hear that. You might also hear people using the pattern son of a something. So this word in an official curse word ends with a very rude word. But some people like to use some kind of crazy word at the end of this expression. So one that you might hear sometimes is son of a gun. That's a good one. Or you might hear people say like son of a beeswax or something kind of weird. They might, they might create something totally original. You can do that with curse words. If you want to just make something up, that's fine to do. I have a friend who says like son of a biscuit, I think. <laughs> so you can make up kind of whatever you feel like expresses yourself in that moment and just choose like a really soft word to kind of express your frustrations. But the point is here, there are a few swear words that are kind of soft. So shoot, darn, dang it, fudge, darn it, these kinds of things, and son of a plus a kind of soft word. These sorts of things express our frustration and they kind of tell the other people around us, oh, I'm aware I made a mistake or oh, I really hurt myself, something like that. So you can use these to express those frustrations and you will not be considered rude for doing that. These are much, much better choices than using a very rude swear word. But of course, if you are in a situation where you hurt yourself, you can just use ow or ugh or ugh. Those kinds of sounds are totally fine. Don't worry about choosing a word. Most of us just go ah when we hurt ourselves. So you can do the same thing too. You don't need to think of a specific vocabulary word unless you want to. So I hope this answers your question about these kind of soft swear words. I hope that you enjoy choosing some and finding some creative new ones for yourself. All right, that is everything that I have for this lesson. Thanks very much for watching this video.
It's me shaking. <laughs> it's a dance. It's, the shake is a dance. What's a dance? It, damn. Okay. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to Know Your Verbs. My name is Alicia, and in this episode, we're going to talk about the verb shake. Let's get started. The basic definition of the verb shake is to move up and down in quick, short movements. Some examples. Shake the ingredients together in a bag. She confidently shook his hand. So now let's take a look at the conjugations for this verb. Present, shake, shakes. Past, shook. Past participle, shaken. Progressive, shaking. So now let's talk about some additional meanings for the verb shake. The first additional meaning is to move around because of physical or emotional disturbance. Some examples. The buildings shook in the earthquake. His voice shook as he told the sad story. In these example sentences, uh, we see that there's some kind of disturbance that's happening. Uh, so in the first one, it's a physical disturbance. So the buildings shook in the earthquake. There was some physical disturbance and the buildings shook. So the, meaning the buildings moved like side to side or maybe up and down. So this motion uh, we refer to as shaking uh, because of some kind of disturbance. In the second example sentence, though, it's someone's voice. So a person's voice shook. His voice shook when he told the sad story. So in this case, it's not like physical motion, but it's like the voice sounds unsteady. So um, this is related to an emotional disturbance. So it's a sad story. He feels emotional, so his voice is shaking. It's like you're, you're struggling not to cry or you're struggling to hold back emotions. Like you can hear a person's voice change um, when they're trying to hold in uh, to not release kind of strong emotions. So we refer to that as like a shaky voice uh, to use the adjective form. Um, but we can also use a verb, uh, shook in this case, past tense. His voice shook when he told the sad story. The second additional meaning for the verb shake is to get away from something or to become free from something. Some examples. I can't shake the feeling I'm being watched. She finally shook her habit of snacking. So in these example sentences, we see that shake is being used to refer to getting free of something, to shake something. So in the first example sentence, we see a common expression, I can't shake the feeling. So I can't shake the feeling means I can't get free. I can't escape from this feeling that I have. In this case, I can't shake the feeling I'm being watched. That means I feel always like someone is watching me. So probably not a good feeling. I can't shake the feeling. Or like, I can't shake the feeling that this was the wrong thing to do. So some kind of feeling you can't escape from. We could say, I can't shake the feeling. In the second example sentence, we see shake used to talk about a bad habit. So the example is, she finally shook her habit of snacking, or we could say her bad habit of snacking. So to shake a habit means to escape from or to be free from a bad habit, some negative thing that you don't want to do anymore. You might have heard this uh, meaning applied in that song from Taylor Swift where she says, shake it off. Uh, she repeats the expression, shake it off, where shake it off is like negativity. Shake it off there means just let it go, like break free from it, escape from that negative feeling. So to shake something off is just to let it go, shake it off. So imagine like it's like dust on your body and you just make a shaking motion and it comes off, you're like you're free, you're escaping from that negativity. That's the kind of image that she's trying to um, suggest in that song, to shake it off. The next additional meaning for the verb shake is to upset someone. So to upset means like to cause their emotional stability to be disturbed. So this can mean to cause someone to be angry or to be sad, to be disappointed. Um, usually angry or sad though. Let's take a look at some examples. The awful story really shook me. He was shaken by the sudden changes at work. 
So in both of these example sentences, shake is being used to refer to a feeling of like unhappiness, of anger, of sadness, some kind of change from regular emotional stability. In the first example sentence, the awful story really shook me. It means like that story was so awful that it affected me, it upset me emotionally. So like I felt really sad or I felt really angry or maybe unhappy in some way. So to feel shook by a story is like something really affected you, or like strongly affected you. So you feel quite upset. It's not just like a common, oh, I feel sad or something. It's more like a strong kind of deeper feeling. Whoa, that shook me. Uh, in the second, what was the second one? He was shake, shaken by the sudden changes at work. Okay. In the second example sentence, he was shaken by the sudden changes at work. It means sudden changes at his job caused him to feel very upset. So all these new things happened and he felt like really surprised or really unhappy or really stressed out. So they upset him from his regular like emotional stability. He was shaken. He was shaken. So we can use that uh, to refer to a strong emotional disturbance. The fourth additional meaning is to decrease stability, to decrease stability. This is slightly different from the third meaning, which was to upset someone. This one is specifically about decreasing stability. So it can mean in like some kind of um, belief um, or it can mean in an organization. Let's look at some examples. The bad news shook her confidence. This is a scandal that could shake the entire government. So in the first example sentence, uh, the bad news shook her confidence. So here it's not just her, but what is being upset? What is decreasing in stability here? Her confidence. So maybe the other parts of her personality are fine, but confidence is affected in this case. So the bad news shook, the bad news decreased the stability of her confidence. So in other words, her confidence kind of decreased. She didn't feel so confident after hearing the bad news. In the second example sentence, the scandal could shake the government. It means this scandal is probably so big that it could decrease the stability in the government. So that means something really terrible happened. And because of that, the government's like regular functions or the government's regular ways of doing things um, might not continue. So it's decreased stability. That's the nuance of this use of shake. One more small point about this one is that this is sometimes used with up. So like in the second example sentence, uh, this scandal could shake up the entire government. Like to shake up something is like to kind of change a known idea. Like we thought we knew everything before, but this new information has shaken everything up, has shaken up the government. Like, oh, it's caused some changes. So like we lost some stability. This could be a good thing though, like to shake up a scientific field, for example, like maybe some new discovery shakes up a scientific field. But in that moment of like discovery or like in my second example of like a scandal, in that moment, maybe stability decreases, but it could, it could lead to something positive in the future. So you really have to pay attention to the situation to understand, is this a positive thing or a negative thing? The first variation is to shake one's head. To shake one's head is this motion. It's this, it's this side to side motion that means you disapprove. It means no, generally. Uh, so let's look at some examples of this. He shook his head when I asked if he was okay. Don't shake your head at me. So to shake your head just means to say no. Like you don't have to say anything. You can use this motion to mean no or to show just disapproval, to show like rejection of something. So in the first example sentence, he shook his head when I asked if he was okay, means he did not say anything, but he shook his head. He made this motion meaning no. I asked, are you okay? And his response was this, meaning no. So. We use that to talk about that action. In the second example sentence, it's a command. So don't shake your head at me. Maybe a mother would say this to her child or a father might say this to his child. Like a child shaking their head like this, like I don't want to do that or rejecting something their parent said. 
Uh, the parent might say, don't shake your head at me. So meaning, don't say no to me. So the next variation, I put these two together because they're very similar. They are to shake loose or to shake something out. So these expressions mean to use a shaking motion to remove something. So to shake loose or to shake something out. Let's look at some examples. She shook her bag loose from the hook. Shake the dirt out of the rug. So in the first example sentence, she shook her bag loose from the hook. It's like uh, her bag is attached to a hook. So a hook is like this sort of thing. You hang your bag here. If the bag is stuck, maybe, or there's some problem, or I don't know, you can't reach it easily. Um, in this case, she shook her bag, meaning she made this shaking motion to remove her bag from the hook. So she shook her bag loose. We use loose to talk about that. But you can use this expression if there's some, like, I don't know, I don't know, maybe you go to buy candy from a vending machine and it gets stuck when you buy the thing. So you might shake it, you might shake your candy loose from the vending machine in that case too. So to shake something loose means to um, get something out of like a jammed situation. In the second example sentence though, we see shake out. So uh, the second example sentence was shake the dirt out of the rug. It means again, make a shaking motion to remove dirt from a rug. So means do this and get the dirt or whatever else is in the rug out. So remove the dirt from the rug by shaking it. So it's to shake something out of something else. Okay, so those are hopefully a few new ways for you to use the verb shake. I hope that you found something new. Uh, if you have any questions or comments or would like to try to make an example sentence, please feel free to do so in the comment section of this video. Hi everybody, welcome back to Know Your Verbs. My name is Alicia and in this episode, we're going to talk about the verb air. Let's get started. Let's begin with a basic definition of the verb air. The basic definition is to broadcast on radio or TV. Some examples. When is this episode going to air? This radio show airs every week. Now let's take a look at the conjugations for each verb. Present, air, airs. Past, aired. Past participle, aired. Progressive, airing. So now let's talk about some additional meanings for this verb. The first additional meaning of the verb air is to express opinions. This is often though um, complaints or problems. Some examples. They aired their grievances at the meeting. Please air any issues with this policy at the next conference. So in these example sentences, we see air used to talk about expressing something, expressing an opinion, but as I said, this is typically some kind of problem. There's an issue. There's um, something that people want to complain about. So when we air a grievance, as in the first example sentence, it means express a complaint, really, or say a complaint, make a complaint. But to air a grievance sounds quite formal. So a grievance is like something you are grieving. In other words, something that makes you unhappy. Uh, but it's a noun, a grievance. So to air a grievance means to express a complaint, to talk about a problem that you have. In the second example sentence, uh, where the expression air any issues you have with the policy, it means again to complain about a policy or to share your opinions about this policy, uh, to share any maybe problems you have about the policy. So to air means to express an opinion. The second additional meaning is to expose to air for ventilation. We often use out with this meaning. Let's take a look at some examples. He aired his laundry outside. We're airing out the bedding today. So in the first example sentence, he aired his laundry outside, we see that he is exposing his clothes, probably, to air outside somewhere. So that means like hanging up clothes so that air can flow through them. Air is a noun here. That means that the um, like breeze or sunlight or whatever makes the clothes feel fresh, hopefully. 
So to air laundry refers to letting laundry be exposed to like sunlight, to the outdoors. In the second example sentence, we're airing out the bedding today. It means the same thing. It means our bedding. So bedding refers to like sheets or like covers or pillowcases, for example. To air out bedding means to expose that to sunlight, to air, to the breeze, so that it becomes more fresh. So to air out um, is sometimes used, or we might just see air, to air something as well. It means to expose it to fresh air, to expose it to the sun as well. This is definitely a short episode, but I think it's important to keep in mind that air actually as a verb has some very interesting and quite different meanings. So keep an eye out for it the next time you see it used as a verb in a sentence. I hope that you found something new. Uh, anyway, if you have any questions or comments about this verb, please feel free to let us know in the comment section of this video. Hi everybody, welcome back to Ask Alicia, the weekly series where you ask me questions and I answer them. Maybe. Let's get to your first question this week. First question comes from Anishka. Hi Anishka. Anishka says, hi Alicia, I love your Ask Alicia series. And my question is, can you explain the difference between beside and besides? Great question. Yeah. Let's start by talking about beside with no S at the end. The word beside means next to. So for example, please sit beside me or her bag is beside the couch. So beside is used to talk about the position of something. On the other hand, besides with an S at the end is used to talk about situations in which we need to add a little bit of extra information to prove a point. So here's an example of this. Let's say you're thinking about going to a concert and you really want to go, but you're not able to because you have a family engagement, for example, like you have a family birthday party or something. You might say, I really wanted to go to that concert, but I have to go to this family party tonight. Besides, the tickets were really expensive. So that besides means in addition to this situation, something else. So we kind of use besides to connect two points that are making the same argument. And we typically do it with kind of negative situations. Like we're saying in the first part, I'm not able to attend this concert that I wanted to go to. Also, the tickets were really expensive. So it's kind of like you're supporting the argument with this besides word to show there's this other reason that you weren't able to do it. So when you're talking about these situations in which something kind of negative is happening and you want to mention another negative thing, you can use besides to do that. So let's look at another example of this. Let's say you're talking with someone about a new job opportunity and you want to know how they're doing. They might say something like, well, I was really interested in the job and the interview went well, but I'm not sure that it's the right fit for me. Besides, there's been a lot of negative information in the news about this company lately. So this is another situation in which you're kind of talking about something that you're choosing not to do or ultimately you're not going to do. And you're giving some extra information to back up that feeling that you have, to back up that opinion. So to back up means to support that opinion. So in both of these situations, you're talking about something that is not going to happen as expected. And then you're also giving another reason for that with besides, like saying, in addition to this sort of kind of uncomfortable situation or this unfortunate situation, there's this other thing that leads me to make the same decision. So this is how we use besides with an S, but we use beside with no S to talk about something that is next to or by or near us. So I hope that this answers your question. Thanks so much for sending it along. Okay, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Asan. Hi, Asan. Asan says, hi, Alicia. Can we use among and between interchangeably? Nice question. No, you cannot use them interchangeably. So among is used when we're talking about a group of something. So for example, let's say you're in the forest and you are standing in the middle of the forest. There are lots of trees around you, right? You could say, I am standing among the trees, right? So that means you're kind of inside a group of something, right? You might also say this when you're in a group of people as well, like, oh, she's standing among the people in the crowd. So this sounds like you're surrounded by something. Or when you have like a lot of things to choose from, you might say like, choose your favorite color from among these choices, which sounds like there are many different options for you. On the other hand, between is used when there are just 
two things. So again, if you are in the forest, for example, and you decide to stand between two trees, you would not use among to describe that. You would say, I am between two trees. I am standing between two trees. You wouldn't say, I'm among two things. We use between when we have two choices. We would do the same thing when we're choosing our favorite color, for example. If you said, please choose your favorite from between these two colors, it sounds like there are only two options. So this was a really quick breakdown of the differences between among and between, but the general guide to keep in mind is that we use among when there are many options or many choices or many things to consider in the situation, and we use between when there are two things to consider in the situation. In my earlier example about the forest, we also use between to talk about a position that is in the middle of two things. So I hope that this quick answer helps you understand the differences between among and between. Thanks so much for sending it along. Okay, let's move on to your next question. Next question comes from Francis Pico. Hello, Francis. I hope I said your name correctly. Francis says, hi, Alicia. Could you tell me the difference between in front of and opposite? Thanks. Okay, nice question. Yeah, so in front of versus opposite. The key difference here is really kind of in your position and kind of in what you want to express in this situation. So I know that's a very, very vague answer. So let's get into what I mean. In front of, let's start here. So when we say that something is in front of something else, it means that the position of that thing, for example, my phone, is directly like before something else. So I could say, my phone is in front of me right now, yeah? Or when you think of like your house, you might be able to think of something that is in front of your house. Maybe there's a fence in front of your house or a road in front of your house, right? So in front of refers to anything that is in the position like before you or before something else. On the other hand, Opposite is used when we have kind of, you can think of like a direct reflection of something on the other side. So what does that mean? So for example, when you go to a restaurant or to a cafe, you're sitting in the restaurant in the cafe and on the other side of the table is another person, right? You're there with your friend, for example. You could say, my friend is opposite me. So why is opposite okay to use here? It's because you are one person and your friend is one person. We use opposite when the two things are facing each other and they are about the same. So another example of this would be building. So let's say you're thinking about your house, for example. You could say, my house is opposite my friend's house. So that sounds like there are two houses, they're kind of the same style building, the same kind of thing, and they are directly on the other side of one another. You could say, yes, my friend's house is in front of my house. Or you could say, I am sitting in front of my friend. That is also okay to say. But we use opposite when we're talking about something that's like a direct reflection of something. And there is some flexibility with this expression. We tend to use it a lot when we're talking about cities and buildings and cities. So for example, if you say, I live opposite the bank, that's okay. Of course, your house is not a bank. That's fine to say, I live opposite the bank. It's just like you're saying, you live in a direct like line of sight from that thing and the two things are kind of roughly the same. So I, if I put my phone on the table at a restaurant, I would not say, I'm I'm sitting opposite my phone. That sounds kind of strange because the two things are not equal. So this is how we use opposite to talk about positions. So in sum, we can use in front of to talk about something that is kind of before us. Anything that is before us that we can kind of see or that we can interact with, that thing is in front of us. That's our position. On the other hand, opposite is used when there's kind of a reflection happening. So one person is here, one person is there. One house is here, one house is there. They're kind of equal sorts of things. This is how we use opposite to talk about position. So I hope that this helped you understand the difference between in front of and opposite. Thanks so much for sending this question along. All right, that is everything that I have for this week. Thank you as always for sending your great questions. Remember, you can send them to me at englishclass101.com slash ask hyphen Alicia. There is a link for this in the YouTube description. So please send me your questions to the official question submission page. Don't send it in a YouTube comment or Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, I don't know, too many comments. Please send it to the official page where I will definitely see it. Of course, if you liked this lesson, don't forget to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Also check us out at englishclass101.com for some other things that can help you with your English studies. Thanks very much for watching this week's episode of Ask Alicia and I will see you again soon, bye. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. Welcome to the 2000 Core English Words and Phrases video series. 
Each lesson will help you learn new words, practice, and review what you've learned. Okay, let's get started. First is lobby. 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 A lobby is the basic place in a hotel, usually, where people can wait or people can make arrangements to meet someone else. It's kind of a space for everyone to use. Here's an example. Hotel lobby. Hotel lobby. Hotel lobby. Wake up service. Wake up service. Wake up service. Wake up service is a service you can request from hotel staff. You can ask the front desk staff at the hotel to call your room at a certain time to wake you up. Here's an example. I used the wake up service to call me at 6 o'clock a.m. I used the wake up service to call me at 6 o'clock a.m. I used the wake up service to call me at 6 o'clock a.m. Sweet. 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 A suite is a type of hotel room. In a suite-style hotel room, there is a kitchen and maybe a sitting area included inside the room. Here's an example. Hotel suite. Hotel suite. Hotel suite. Cycling. 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 Cycling is a popular sport. Cycling uses a bicycle. Usually, people who cycle like to go for long distances and even participate in competitions. Here's an example. Cycling race. Cycling race. Cycling race. Auto racing. Auto racing. Auto racing. Auto racing is short for automobile racing. So this refers to a sport where cars are raced on a racing track. Here's an example. Racing car on an auto racing track. Racing car on an auto racing track. Racing car on an auto racing track. Scotch tape. Scotch tape. Scotch tape. Scotch tape is actually a brand of tape. This is a very commonly used kind of very clear, thin tape we often use around the house, in the office, at school, and so on. Here's an example. Roll of scotch tape. Roll of scotch tape. Roll of scotch tape. Be born. Be born. Be born. So we use born to talk about the date of our birth or the location of our birth. Make sure when you use this verb that you change the be verb to match your subject. For example, I was born, he was born, she was born, or you were born, and so on. For example, I was born in 1980. I was born in 1980. I was born in 1980. Get a job. Get a job. Get a job. To get a job means to go out and search for a way to earn money. This can be a part-time job, a full-time job, a freelance job, and so on. Here's an example. My brother finally got a job. My brother finally got a job. My brother finally got a job. Die. 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 The verb to die means to no longer be alive. We can use the verb to talk about people no longer being alive, animals, plants, basically any living thing. Here's an example. Die of an illness. Die of an illness. Die of an illness. Tokyo. 
Tokyo. Tokyo. Tokyo is a very, very big city in Japan. It's one of the biggest cities, if not the biggest city, in terms of population in the world. Here's an example Tokyo is really convenient. Tokyo is really convenient. Tokyo is really convenient. Let's review. I'm going to describe a word or phrase in English. See if you can remember it. Then repeat after me, focusing on pronunciation. Ready? Do you remember how to say the open space, usually in a hotel, where people can meet others? Lobby. Lobby. And how to say the service you can ask for in the hotel where the front desk staff will call you in the morning? Wake up service. Wake up service. Okay, what about the type of hotel room that has a kitchen and maybe a sitting area included? Sweet. Sweet. Do you remember how to say the sport that's done by riding a bicycle for long distances? Cycling. Cycling. Okay, let's try the sport that's played by using cars at very fast speeds on a racetrack. Auto racing. Auto racing. What about the word that describes the common office tool that is very sticky on one side and used to connect two things together? Scotch tape. Scotch tape. Now, let's see if you remember how to say the verb we use to talk about the place of our birth. Or the date of our birth. Be born. Be born. Another one. What about the expression we use when we finally find a way to earn some money in exchange for doing some tasks? Get a job. Get a job. Do you remember how to express when someone or something alive no longer is living? Die. Die. And finally, do you remember how to say the name of Japan's biggest city? Tokyo. Tokyo. Well done. See you next time. Bye. Hi, everybody. My name is Alicia. In this lesson, I'm going to talk about prepositions that we use in common present perfect tense sentences. I'm going to talk about four prepositions and how we commonly use them. Let's get started. Okay. First, I want to practice a few examples with the preposition to. to. So, we use to, one of the uses of to is to express motion or to refer to some motion happening. So, we use to in present perfect tense expressions when we're talking about traveling or we're talking about movement from one place to another. So, these are a few common verbs that we use to with. Of course, for today's lesson, I'm focusing on present perfect tense, but of course, you can use these verbs in other tenses with this preposition too. So, some very common examples are I have been to place, or I have traveled to place, I have driven to place. So, for this lesson, these are all the past participle forms of the verbs, but again, you can use,、uh, for example, past tense or a future tense expression as well. 
Another key point is when you use the preposition to, you need to use a specific place name. For example, I've been to China, or I've traveled to France, or I've driven to school. So we're using a specific place name here. A common error, a common mistake that I hear among learners is that people will use the word there here, like I have been to there. That's incorrect. We need to use a specific place name here. We can't use there and a preposition. If you want to say there, just remove the preposition. I've been there. Oh, I've traveled there. I've driven there. And then it's perfect. So again, to plus a specific place or there with no preposition. Another situation where you'll use to is when you're talking about movement of like objects as well. So in this case, digital objects. We can imagine files as digital objects. For example, he has sent the files to the clients. So here again with this to, we're talking about some movement. In the first example, it was movement of people, like an actual body or bodies moving from place to place. In this example, we're talking about data or we're talking about objects moving from place to place. So with a verb like maybe send, in this case sent, the past participle form, we use to to talk about that. So the item or items in this case that is moving and the direction here. So we're marking this destination and we're showing the movement, the relationship here with to. So we use to to express motion to talk about movement. And we use to before the destination, the place where we're going, or in this case, uh, the person receiving something. Okay, so now let's go to at. The second part I want to talk about is at. We use at to mark the location of something, the place where an action occurs, the place where something happens. So there are many different verbs that we can use with at, and similar to to, we follow at with a specific location. So again, we don't say at there, we can't use that pattern. We need to use at plus a specific place name or like a city name, country name, and so on. So some examples of verbs you might use are study or see or stay. So these are verbs that aren't relating like to movement. We're not moving from one place to another and objects aren't moving from one place to another place. Rather, these verbs are talking about actions where like we as people, people remain in place or as objects, the object remains in place. There's not movement really. So when we want to express that, we put the verb uh, in this case, past participle form. And then we follow that, or we follow the verb phrase with at and connect it to the place. So for example, I have studied at ABC College. I have studied at ABC College. So I cannot use to here. I have studied to ABC College is incorrect because this verb is not indicating motion in some way. It's study. So study is the action and we're talking about the place where the action happened. So there's not, like, we're not reporting on movement or motion of any kind. Another example, we haven't seen a basketball game at the city arena. We haven't seen a basketball game at the city arena. So again, at is marking this specific location where an activity, seeing a basketball game, happens, or in this case, has not happened. So the speaker is saying, we have not had the experience of watching or seeing a basketball game at this arena. So we're marking the location with at. My verb is see here. Again, we're not talking about motion or movement. We're talking about staying in one place and doing something in that location. One more example, she has stayed at that hotel. She has stayed at that hotel. So my verb is stay, the past participle form is stayed, 
and I'm talking about that hotel, specifically that hotel. So yes, I'm using that, that's fine. In a conversation, I might say something, or the first person in this conversation might say something like, oh, hey, does she know that hotel or has she heard of that hotel? And the follow-up might be, yeah, she has stayed at that hotel. So a specific hotel here. Again, this is the action, staying. Staying is the action. We mark it with at. So we cannot use to here. She has stayed to that hotel is incorrect because to marks motion. Stay is not a motion, it is not a movement. We are doing it in place, in this location. So please be careful when you're choosing between at and to uh, for these kinds of expressions. Yes, we can use both prepositions before a specific place, but they have different functions. So at marks our location for something, to is marking our motion and movement towards a location. Okay, so let's go on to the second part of this lesson. For the second part, I want to talk about for and since, very, very commonly used with present perfect tense. First, we use for to mark time periods, time periods, so a length of time. We use for to mark this. For example, he has worked here for two years. He has worked here for two years. So the activity is working, in this case he has worked here, and we're marking this time period, years, with four. So four shows us the length of time that something happened. So this sentence means he's still working here, like this is an ongoing activity, this is still happening, and we want to mention how long the activity has happened. Another example, she has been sleeping for 10 hours. She has been sleeping for 10 hours. So yes, this is an example that's in the present perfect progressive form. That's fine. You can use the same rules with present perfect progressive. Again, we're marking a time period with four. You'll notice too that these are all in the plural form. So make sure it's not two year or for 10 hour, whatever. We need to make sure to pronounce clearly and write in writing this S here to make the plural form. So this is marking a time period, a length of time. One more example, we have been dating for six months. We have been dating for six months. So that means six months ago, we started dating and since that time, I'll talk about since in just a moment, for that time period until this conversation, the dating has continued. So they have been in a relationship. So we use for to mark this kind of time. So we cannot use to, we cannot use at here. So we don't use to because we're not showing motion of some kind. We, he has worked here two, two years is incorrect. We cannot use at because we're not sharing some location of an activity. The focus here is on a period of time. So. Let's compare this to since, since. We use since as a preposition to mark a past point in time, to mark a past point in time. So this is a key difference with for. For marks a period of time. Since marks a past point only. So we're not marking like a duration, we're not marking a length of time. Since tells us when something started or maybe the last time something happened, depending on the sentence. So let's look at some examples. I've lived here since 2013. I've lived here since 2013. So since marks our past point in time, 2013. So that means beginning in 2013 and continuing until this conversation, I've lived here, I've lived here. So since tells us when it started in this case. Here though, let's look at a negative. We haven't seen you since high school. We haven't seen you since high school. So since comes before high school here. Now high school is not like a point in time, like a year or a month or a day, no. But it marks a point like in life, high school. So we can understand high school is our point in the past here. And the action, we haven't seen you. So that means from high school until this conversation, the speakers did not see the listener in this 
period of time. So high school is the starting point, the conversation is the ending point, and they want to express in this period uh, they did not meet, they did not see each other. One more example, she hasn't come to work since Monday. She hasn't come to work since Monday. So here, our specific past point is Monday. Since tells us that. And she hasn't come to work. So starting at this point in the past, starting at Monday, this person, she has not come to work. So until this conversation, so no appearance by this person. So since is marking some past point in time, for is marking a period of time, a duration of time. So we can't use these uh, interchangeably. We can't switch them up. Also, we cannot use to or at in these cases either. No location is being given. Like, yes, high school, a high school is a location, but here we're talking about a period of life that is high school, a time period of life. Uh, so we can't use at, we can't use to here. So I hope that this is helpful uh, in choosing between for and since, and I hope this is helpful in choosing between to and at. Of course, we can use other prepositions as well, but these are some very common ones, and I think good ones for learners to practice. So I hope that it was helpful for you. Of course, if you have any questions or comments, or if you want to practice making example sentences, or if you want to talk about some other prepositions, please feel free to do so in the comment section of this video. Also, please don't forget to like the video and make sure to check us out at EnglishClass101.com for more stuff to help you with your English studies and make sure to subscribe to our channel if you haven't already. Thanks very much for watching this lesson and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye! Hi everyone, I'm Christine from EnglishClass101.com. In this video, we'll be talking about 10 words to describe your feelings. Let's begin! Calm. Please calm down. Calm means quiet or peaceful. If someone is upset or agitated, you can tell them to calm down. Energetic. Tom is an energetic person. If someone has a lot of energy, you can say they're energetic. You can use this if someone is really active or hyper. Happiness. Nothing is more important than happiness. This is a noun form of the word happy. When you're happy, you are experiencing happiness. Emotional. My friend gets so emotional when she talks about politics. If someone shows very strong feelings about something, you could say they're being emotional. If a movie, song, or something else makes you feel like crying from happiness or sadness, you can say it's emotional. Anger. You have to control your anger. Anger is a thing you feel when you're angry. If something really bothers or annoys you, it makes you feel angry. Jealousy. Jealousy is an ugly thing. Jealousy is what you feel when you are unhappy that someone else succeeded. It's also something you feel if you think your boyfriend or girlfriend likes someone else. Excitement. The thought of going to Disney World fills me with excitement. If you're really looking forward to something fun, you can say that you feel excited. Grumpy. I'm always grumpy in the morning until I have some coffee. If someone is grumpy, it means they're not happy and you probably should leave them alone. A grumpy person usually seems really negative. Remorseful. I feel pretty remorseful about how I quit my job. Feeling remorseful about something is similar to feeling sorry about something. Proud. I'm really proud of my son for making such good grades. Feeling proud of someone is when you feel really good about them for something they did. You can also feel proud of things you've done, like if you're proud of how hard you worked. Okay, that's all for 10 words to describe your feelings. And if you really want to become fluent and speak English from the very first lesson, go to EnglishClass101.com. Please leave a comment and don't forget to subscribe. I'll see you next time. Bye.
Are you struggling to understand conversations in your target language? This video will improve your listening skills using practice dialogues. How do you know if your language skills are improving? Our team of teachers have designed a free quiz to determine your actual learning level. So click the link in the description to get your free assessment and unlock lessons that are right for you. In this lesson, you'll listen to a dialogue with the text. Second, you'll review the key vocabulary followed by the English translations. And finally, you'll review the dialogue with the text again to master what you learned. First, listen to the dialogue with the text on the screen. Look at this blouse, Jess. Wow, that's a nice color. It looks very pretty on you, Ashley. Thank you. I really like it. Are you going to buy it? I think I am, but I wish it were on sale. It's a bit expensive. Well, there's no sales tax in Portland. Is that considered on sale? Ha! Huh. That sealed the deal. I'll buy it. Now you'll hear the key vocabulary, followed by the English translation. Blouse. A woman's loose upper garment resembling a shirt. Blouse. Blouse. Our second word is? Color. The appearance something has because of the way it reflects light. Color. Color. Next we have? Pretty. Visually pleasing. Attractive. Pretty. Pretty. Next is? Buy. To get something in exchange for money. Buy. Buy. Our next word is? Sale. The exchange of a commodity for money. Sale. Sale. Next we have? Tax. Compulsory contribution to state revenue. Tax. Tax. Next is? Considered. Thought carefully about. Considered. Considered. Next is? Sealed. The state of being joined or rendered impervious. Sealed. Sealed. And our last word is? Deal. Agreement or transaction between people. Deal. Deal. Finally, let's review the dialogue again. See if you can understand more this time. Look at this blouse, Jess. Wow, that's a nice color. It looks very pretty on you, Ashley. Thank you. I really like it. Are you going to buy it? I think I am, but I wish it were on sale. It's a bit expensive. Well, there's no sales tax in Portland. Is that considered on sale? Ha! Huh. That sealed the deal. I'll buy it. This is the end of the lesson. In this lesson, you improved your listening and mastered key vocabulary for everyday life conversation. Don't forget to click the link in the description to get your free assessment and unlock lessons that are right for your learning level. Keep practicing and move on to the next lesson. Hi everybody, my name is Alicia. In this lesson, I'm going to talk about expressions you can use to decline or reject invitations. So these are expressions you can use to politely say no to something. Let's get started. Okay, on this side of the board, I want to talk about some casual expressions. These are expressions you can use with friends, with family members, with close coworkers. These are everyday expressions you can use to say no when someone invites you to something. Let's start with the first one. Thanks for the invitation, but 
So at native speed, this sounds like, thanks for the invitation, but you can use this in speech and you can use this in writing. A couple of points, thanks for, we use thanks for, and we use the invitation, the invitation. So this the means your invitation this time. Thanks for the invitation, but, and after but, we include some reason. So I'm going to say no, here's my reason. Thanks for the invitation, but I have to work that day. Thanks for the invitation, but I have to work that day. So I've used that day in my example, but you can change that day to I have to work tonight, or I have to work tomorrow, or I have to work that weekend. Whatever the time, whatever the day of the invitation, you can change this part of the pattern. Sorry, I have to work that day. At native speed, this sounds like, thanks for the invitation, but I have to work, or thanks for the invitation, but I have to work that day. Okay, the next one, I already have plans. I already have plans. Please notice here, plans is in the plural form. So not I already have a plan, but I already have plans. We use this plans to talk about something we already decided to do. I already have plans. This one is one I personally don't use a lot, because it's not specific. If someone says, sorry, I already have plans, I feel like it's a lie, like they don't wanna join me and they don't have a good reason not to, so they say this. I feel like this is one you can use if you really don't wanna join someone and you don't have a good reason to do that uh, or you don't have a good reason not to join. So. I don't like to use this one generally. I'll try to be specific, like, ah, oh, sorry, I have to work. Like, there's usually a reason I can't do something. But you may hear this, which means someone already has a plan. Of course, you can use this as well if you have, if you really do have a plan and you just, you don't want to tell the other person. It's a private plan or there's some reason you want to keep it a secret. You can use, I already have plans. Okay, the next one is, I'm not feeling well. I'm not feeling well. So don't forget this, mm, I'm, I'm not, I not, but I'm not. I'm not feeling well. This means I'm sick. So I'm a little bit sick. That's the feeling here. I'm not feeling well in the progressive form here shows that this is my condition now. So at native speed, thanks for the invitation, but I'm not feeling well. So this means I'm sick, sorry, I can't join you. And you can use good here too. You will hear native speakers say, I'm not feeling good, I'm not feeling so good, I'm not feeling great. You can change it a little bit, but this is another common way to reject an invitation. Okay, another very useful one, this one I use a lot, uh, honestly, is I'm really busy with work. I'm really busy with work. Of course, you can change work to studies. I'm really busy with my studies or I'm really busy studying for a test. Again, I'm, don't forget this mm sound, I'm really busy. And you can change this, you can remove really and say, sorry, I'm busy with work. I can't, I'm busy with work. That's fine as well. Really is just an emphasis word. Sorry, I'm really busy with work. Also, we use this preposition here. I'm really busy with work. Or if you are at the office when you reply to this, in most cases. You can say, I'm really busy at the office today, or I'm really busy at work today. Sorry, I can't come. You may also hear that's used uh, for places. I'm really busy at the office. Sorry, I'm really busy at school today. You can use it for places too. Or you can use with plus work or studies. At native speed, it sounds like, thanks for the invitation, but I'm really busy with work. Okay, last one is, I'm spending time with my family. I'm spending time with my family. So again, I'm, I am, plus the progressive spending. I'm spending time. So spending time means I'm taking time or I'm using my time now 
to be with my family. I'm spending time with my family. So this means I have a plan, or right now, uh, my pl uh, I am actually in the act of spending time with my family. So you can use this uh, to mean now at the moment, or you can also use this expression to mean on that day. So on the date of the invitation, you can use the same expression too. So sorry, I'm spending time with my family on that day. So in native speed sounds like thanks for the invitation, but I'm spending time with my family. Okay, so these are a few good examples, I think, of reasons you can give uh, when you need to reject an invitation. Some other things you might hear at the beginning of this statement are, sorry, I can't, sorry, I can't. So this is common in like text messages because it's so short. This is especially common when you're talking with very close friends. Like you don't need to say, thanks for the invitation every time, but this is very quick and easy. Sorry, I can't, I have to work that day. So follow, sorry, I can't with one of these expressions or something similar. Another good one is, I would love to, but, I would love to, but, so this to is like a response to the invitation, a verb in the invitation. For example, do you want to see a new movie this weekend? So I would love to see a new movie, but we drop the rest of that uh, expression. I would love to, verb from the invitation, but I have to work that day. I already have plans. So I would love to. So this means this is an unreal situation. Like that sounds good. That sounds awesome. I want to do that, but I can't. So we use would here instead of will because this is unreal, a future thing that is unreal. So I would love to, but I can't. So these are casual expressions you can use with your friends. Okay, let's go to some formal expressions on this side of the board. Of course, these expressions you can use at work as well. They don't sound rude. I would suggest using this one for work invitations to sound a little bit more polite, but sometimes you have invitations that are more formal. Uh, so perhaps a business event or an academic event. Here's one example of a way to reject an invitation. I appreciate the invitation, but I am unable to attend. I appreciate the invitation, but I am unable to attend. So here, I appreciate the invitation. This is a leveled up form of thanks for the invitation. So I appreciate the invitation, but, so we have the same pattern here, just the level of formality is different. I appreciate the invitation, but I am unable. Unable means not able, I cannot do something. I am unable to attend, so to come, in other words. So this is for uh, some kind of work event, some kind of maybe academic conference, for example. I appreciate the invitation, but I'm unable to attend. You may hear a reason after this, I'm unable to attend due to something, something. I'm unable to attend due to a prior engagement or something like this. So engagement, a prior engagement means a plan I made before. So a prior, prior means before. Engagement means some kind of activity, some kind of appointment. So this is a fancy way of saying, thanks for the invitation, I can't come because I have other plans. That's what this means in a formal setting. So this is quite common uh, for, again, more polite situations. I want to introduce one more here. Uh, this one is one that we use in writing. Please note we use this in writing. This is a very common way to begin a rejection letter. So this is something uh, you may see from universities in particular. If you apply for a school, you apply to enter a university, or you maybe apply for a job or something similar and you receive a rejection letter or rejection email, you may see this near the beginning of the message. So the message is, we regret to inform you that. 
or we regret to inform you. You may see it without that. This means we are sorry to tell you. So regret means we have sad feelings about something. Like we don't want to tell you this, but we have to. We regret to inform. To inform means to give information, to tell someone something, to share someone, or to share information with someone. So we regret to inform you means we're very sorry to tell you that your application has not been accepted. Your application has not been accepted. So this could be a school application, it could be a job application, or something else. Has not been accepted. You may also see simple past tense. Your application was not accepted. It just means no. Sorry, your application was not accepted. Or sorry, we can't accept you at this time. So this is a very common way to begin the rejection message. Again, this is something that we use in writing. We don't really use this in speech, but it's quite well known. Okay, let's look at one more way to reject an invitation. Unfortunately, I am not able to participate this time. Unfortunately, I'm not able to participate this time. Or perhaps you might hear, unfortunately, I'm not able to attend this time. So a couple points, unfortunately, shows like, ah, it's too bad. That's kind of what it means. Sorry, it's too bad. but. I am not able. So again, we see this, I am not able, which is just like I am unable. Both are correct. You can choose whichever you prefer. I am not able to participate, to participate. So this means it could be an event, it could be some kind of activity, whatever, to participate. You might use this sometimes instead of attend, maybe if someone uh, invites you to speak at an event or something like that, you might use participate instead of just attend the event. And this part is nice to include, this time, this time. So that means for this event in particular, I'm not able to participate, sorry. But it's like in the future, maybe I can. So this time shows that, you know, you can maybe not come now, but perhaps in the future, if there's an opportunity, you might be able to join. So I like to include this time when I have to reject an invitation in a formal way. So finally, I want to end this by talking about like positive endings. So how to conclude a message or how to conclude uh, some kind of rejection message. We tend to end them with a positive feeling. So next time, this is a good one for your friends and for your family members. Sorry, I can't see a movie with you tonight next time. So this means next time we have this chance or I'll spend time with you next opportunity. So next time is a really quick and easy way to say like, please invite me again or let's find another day to get together. This is a good one for events. I hope I can come next time. I hope I can come next time means I hope I'm able to attend. I hope I'm able to join your event or join your party, whatever, the next time it happens or the next time you do something. This one, we wish you all the best. This is another one that you will see usually in writing. This might come at the end of a rejection letter. We wish you all the best. We wish you all the best means like all the best in your life. We wish you lots and lots of good things in your life. So like we don't want you to feel upset, though this was maybe a sad letter, but we have good wishes for you. We wish you all the best. Okay, this is another good one for events, for like maybe parties or conferences that you cannot attend. I hope it's a great event. I hope it's a great event. I hope it is a great event, or I hope it's a good event. Or you can change event to party or to conference or to seminar, whatever the activity is. And finally, best of luck with, best of luck with the event or best of luck with your studies. So again, this is like saying good luck. You can change good luck to best of luck, excuse me. And when we use best of luck or good luck, we use the preposition with, best of luck with the event or good luck with the event. Or 
best of luck with your studies. So this introduces, again, like some kind of well-wishing expression. Best of luck with something or good luck with something. So these are some ways that you can reject or decline offers. So I hope that this was helpful for you. Of course, if you know any other expressions to say no to something, please feel free to share those in the comments. Of course, also, if you have any questions or comments or want to practice making sentences with these expressions, please feel free to do so in the comment section below. Also, if you like this lesson, please don't forget to give it a thumbs up, subscribe to our channel if you have not already, and check us out at EnglishClass101.com for some other things that can help you with your English studies. Thanks very much for watching this lesson, and I will see you again soon. Bye-bye! Expand your vocabulary with our core 2,000 words ebook. It's free and packed with essential expressions that you'll use on a daily basis. Start building your vocabulary today. Click the link in the description below to download your free English ebook before it's gone.